What could compel a seemingly nice person to murder an elderly woman? Oftentimes, it seems a switch flips in a person's brain, giving them the ability to perform horrible acts out of rage that they didn't previously fathom possible. Today's suspect claimed that the victim in this case called him names and hit him, which sent him into a murderous rage due to post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, from childhood family trauma. For today's case, we'll be going to the southwest of the US, to a small suburb called Nambe, located in Santa Fe County, New Mexico. With just over 1,900 residents, Nambe is characterized as a quiet community with a suburban, rural, mixed feel to it. In 2012, a 63-year-old retired librarian from the Santa Fe area named Elvira Segura had been living alone peacefully among the quiet community. She was kind-hearted and enjoyed helping others in her small community. Everyone who knew her remembers her beaming warmth, her intelligence, and her passion. Elvira had known and befriended a 53-year-old handyman named Robert Powell, who in 2012 was homeless and needed a place to stay. Elvira allowed Robert to stay with her, on the condition that he could help around the house. Robert soon moved in with Elvira and began helping with everyday tasks, such as cleaning the house, running errands, and cooking food. But about four years later, in September of 2016, things took a turn for the worse for both Robert and Elvira. Before we get into the details told by Robert, let's talk about what was confirmed during that fateful month. On September 27th, 2016, in Las Cruces, New Mexico, police found an abandoned silver Kia located in a pecan orchard. It was soon found to be registered to Elvira Segura. That same day, police performed a welfare check at her home and unfortunately found her deceased in the bathroom. State police investigator Patrick Montoya said the body was so decomposed it was hard to tell what exactly had happened to lead to her death. In the beginning of the investigation into Elvira's death, police had no leads, until mid-October when a tip came in about a friend of hers who might know some information. That friend was Robert Mondrian Powell, a 60-year-old handyman who had been living with Elvira for a little over four years, and although police wanted to find Robert, they were unable to find him for a few weeks. Police found Robert's EBT card was being used at a grocery store in Las Cruces, and after brief surveillance, they were able to confront and bring him into the station for questioning. When police officers initially brought him in, he mentioned that he had no idea why he was there. It soon became clear that he knew more than he initially was admitting. According to Robert, he and Elvira were amazing friends until the last year or so. He claims that Elvira had become mean and abusive. He also claimed if she started drinking, she would just get absolutely enraged at anything. Robert claims that a night in September 2016, Elvira began calling him names and a fight between them quickly escalated when Elvira hit him with a TV. He says at one point he pushed her down onto the floor and hit her head on the brick floor several times. Robert told the investigator that he then went and got the gun from under the mattress, pointed it at Elvira, and told her to relax and calm down. When she went down on one knee, he pulled the trigger and shot her. He pulled the door closed and never opened it again. Investigator Patrick Montoya explains that he was absolutely shocked by the confession. Let's watch the edited version of the interrogation and confession of Robert Mondrian Powell. You'll notice that Robert seems like a nice guy, who opens up fairly quickly after thoroughly complaining about the victim in this case. Let's get right into it. Appreciate you coming down and talking to us. You know what I want to talk to you about? No. How long did you live with Elvira Segura? Four years and one month, almost exactly. How did you come across her? I mean, I knew her for quite a long time. When I was the manager of a bookstore, she used to do business with us because she worked for the city library. So when did you first meet her? Around 2001, when I started doing school and municipal accounts. Why did you live with her? Uh, did you, I don't know if you had a relationship? I would, no, we didn't have, we, we were just friends. Okay. But the reason I lived with her was because I was homeless at the time, and she thought it would be best if I stayed with her. And then I helped out. I did a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff around the house. And when did you live with her until? Three weeks, four weeks ago. Four weeks ago? And when was the last time that you actually saw her? It's been about a month and a half. It's been more than a month. What 
kind of things did you do around the house? You said you did some. So Byron was retired, and by her own admission, she was quite lazy. When I first moved in there, there was like 40-some-odd bags of trash in a room, and then there was rat feces and stuff like that. The place was a mess. She only had one working toilet. So I said, well, you know, for my room and board and to keep me busy, I'll, you know, start doing stuff. So I did. She liked my cooking. I'm a pretty good cook. So I started doing like 95% of the cooking. So it was both basically just running the house. Let's see. Boy, I did a lot of stuff. I installed a brand new oven. What do you call it? The disposal? Sweet disposal? I did all the gardening for some more than three years. Oh, God, I did a lot of things. put together a lot of stuff that she was, she got addicted to uh, Amazon. She started buying a lot of stuff, so I had to put together everything. She messed up her knee or something. <clears throat> she was loath to go to the doctor to get things, you know, straightened out. Her knee was kind of bad, so the, the dog had to be walked every day, you know, twice a day. You really fixed up her house, huh? Yeah, well, it wasn't exactly falling apart, but I mean, she, it just wasn't working for her. I don't know, she met up with some guy. I don't remember his name, but he was Polish. Edward something. He was bad news for her, I guess, and strange. And then she was drinking a lot at one time, and she absolutely could not drink. If she was started drinking, she would just get absolutely enraged at anything. Oh, what's his name? Dr. Frazier next door, I guess. They took out a restraining order against her. So she was just like livid with her neighbors for doing that to her. Carl was making too much noise across the way. She would get up and run over there and I'd try to stop her. But she would get up and run over there and start yelling at him for making so much noise. And anyway, this guy caused trouble and he had to split because it was just too much hassle. And then Carl called the code violations or whatever because her um, septic system was malfunctioning. She needed a, what do you call it, a leech line, I think it is. And um, I told her, I said, well, I know how to put it in, but I said, I can't do all that digging by myself. So she called somebody finally, but they, um, she ignored it. Now I know she got the warrant or, or the, what do you call it? Not the warrant, but the, whatever it is where you have to appear in court. I know she got it, but she, said she didn't and then so they called uh, somebody to come and pick her up she had to spend the night in jail and she didn't like that much either mm -hmm. and she called somebody and they came out and put out the or the, they dug the hole and i got the you know the, the material to do it with and i put most of it in it wasn't hard but i i didn't have the equipment to dig the hole and stuff but yeah she she had some problems with some people she didn't really talk to too many people really and she got kind of bad where she would um, have problems talking on the phone. She didn't like to go to the store. Sometimes she'd get, it would take her a day and a half to get worked up to go to the store. She'd have to force herself. And she had the ups and downs and stuff really bad, kind of sometimes pretty severe. Hmm. She would get her prescriptions and she would, I don't know if it's abuse or overuse. I, I don't know, I, either way, it's, it's not doing your prescriptions right and she would like take it a bunch right you said she didn't have a lot of friends the entire time i lived there there was one guy he was a native american that she knew that had stayed with her at one time i'm sorry i don't remember his name i just met him the one time well there was a neighborhood guy but he wasn't really a friend he was just a strange guy that used to come around and then and then i well i did see edward once to Edward came there once. He wasn't, I don't think he was supposed to be there. He showed up the day before her court date to figure out her septic system. And um, he went to court. After they got out of court, after we got out of court and stuff, they got into it. So I have no idea what it was about. It was just screaming and yelling and blah, blah. It was really bad. So he jumped out of the car and just left. And that's the last I've seen of him. What would you consider you to Elvira? A good, that was a good friend of hers. Yes. Would it be fair to say that she was mean? She was very mean. She was abusive. Was she abusive towards you? What is that? So a scar from the last time that she hit me with a folding table. Okay. <clears throat> when was that? Just before I left. And what uh, started that situation? I have no idea. She would... You'd be... 
reading or watching TV or sleeping. She seemed to come at you when you'd be sleeping. She would just start going off. I, I do remember now why I got this was because her headphones on her computer stopped working and she listened to audiobooks. And in the meantime, she said, well, I guess I'm going to have to buy a new computer. I said, that's, that's just plain silly. Let me, let me look this up. Then she got up and she went to her easy, another easy chair, started to read. And she said, I'm, she goes, I really want something soothing. The tapioca would take a long time to soak. So I said, well, I can make you some vanilla pudding real quick. No big deal. She said, yes, please. And that afternoon after I got through watering the garden, I was laying in bed and I was like half asleep. And I hear, I hear just a screeching noise and I thought, what in the world? So I sat up and when I sat up, she came storming into the room. She said something about, I can buy my own computer if I want to. And she was just yelling at the top of her lungs. And I said, well, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say you couldn't afford a computer or something. I said, that's really your business, but I'm just, I'm sorry I made that comment. To tease her, I took the, what do you call it, the tablet, and I put it on video. I thought, well, maybe she'll come down. And I was filming her in her rage. <laughs> and she did not like that at all. I meant it as a joke. It was definitely she didn't like it. So then later that evening, I felt this poking on my back. And sometimes the dog would come and poke you with his nose, with her nose. And I thought it was her, but it was her. And she goes, she starts, she said right away, oh, did I startle you? And she was like, really, you know sarcastic and all this oh gosh she started going on and on about this that and the other and i went to turn around to put the tablet it had a little case thing and i went to put it down and i pushed it aside and uh she grabbed it and so i was watching tv she would yank the tv with the wires and everything away and she yanked it so hard that she it fell down on the on the top of the console that it was on and uh I cracked the screen just all to hell, you know, so I wasn't going to respond to that if I could help it. And I told her not to do this before. She liked to take her hands and put them around your neck or pull your, you know, your shirt, or whatever, like that, and, and pull you in, into her face while she yelled at you. And I told her, don't do that, please. I, I said, you don't have the right to do that. That's not right. I mean, I screamed at her, yelled at her, don't do that. And it didn't seem to have any effect. And this time she started it again. And I turned around and I rolled up kind of like on my side and I was just like trying to ignore her. The next thing I know I hear the, there was a little like a TV tray, you know, a wooden TV folding tray mm -hmm. there with a fan on it and the fan went crashing to the ground and I didn't see her do it, but I know certainly I felt it and I turned around and there it comes crashing down on me, oh, hit, hit my arm and my head like right there on the top and then it hit my arm and, and I was oh and she, boy she whacked me good too <laughs> she whacked me good it splintered splintered the table um, and then she grabbed um, the TV remote which was a great kind of a big affair a big thing like that that lights up and she threw that how did you defend yourself against that I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to hit her nothing like that once I pushed her because she was right on top of me. I didn't push her like this, but I had my knee up and she went into my knee and I extended my knee and she she went backwards into the couch. She seemed to get like more excited. It was like she wanted to incite you to do something. One time, and well, I used to try to avoid her. What I would do is like totally remove myself. Once she was listening into a conversation that I was having on a cell phone. I don't know where she got the idea that I was talking about her, but she got like real paranoid. And I referred to something as stupid, but it, I didn't say Elvira is stupid or anything like that. But she went into a rage and started yelling at me while I was on the phone to this person. And the person I was on the phone with was like, what? What did you say? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I, said, I said, but she's mad about something. I left my cell phone out on the porch. And so the next day I went to go get it. And um, it wasn't there. And right away I knew she had taken it. Another thing was she wanted you to be wrong and to apologize. I think it was the next day after that, then she started in again. She started going on and on about how Elvira is stupid and stupid me and how could I be so stupid. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I never referred to you as stupid. So it just, oh, just didn't stop, didn't stop. So she started the physical stuff again, getting in your face and things. And that's the time when I yelled at her. I said, you have no right to touch me. Don't do that. She stopped for a little while and 
so I went to the bedroom. I closed the door, but she kept opening the door and turning off the, the overhead fan, which is very childish, and she turned off the electricity in the bedroom. You know, she didn't turn off the electricity in the bathroom. <laughs> so she, you know. But anyway, uh, so she kept coming back and forth, back and forth, and finally, finally I said, I'll be right enough. And so I closed the door, and it didn't have a lock on it. She had a penchant for slamming doors, which always just made me, like, lose it. I would be so nervous because I can't stand that. I pulled a heavy desk in front of the door because it opened in. So I put the desk up there, and I put a chair against it, and I, you know, so she couldn't really get in. She could jam it a little bit, but so she was screaming through the crack, and she got tired of that. So, and then she came later and started start saying, you want your phone? You know, really sarcastic. And I think I stayed in the bedroom for, I want to say, three three days solid. And I went to bed, literally, and just slept. I didn't watch TV. I, I might have listened to the radio, but several years ago, I was diagnosed, well, twice, I was diagnosed with PTSD. My reaction when something like that happens that doesn't make sense is to just, like, go away from it. I, I've been trying to avoid it all, most of my, all of my adult life. Well, eventually, she got mad, and she called the state police or the sheriff, I don't remember who it was, and uh, she uh, separated us because she kept coming in and screaming, and I said, you know, I said, I, she's just been this way, and I said, I just didn't want to have to deal with it, so I shut myself up in here. So, is that why you left? Mm -hmm. That, no, this, no, this happened once before, this was another incident. No, it was not because of that, but why didn't you tell us why you left? anyway, she, um, well, because, but anyway, the police officer um, finally talked to her and he gave me back the telephone and, and he told us we need to sit down and talk and so I did and she got real dramatic and she had, uh, something had happened to her car. She, she got in her car and she, uh, she left the keys on and the battery was dead. She said, you, you um, sabotaged my car and I said, no, Vera, you left the keys in the car on and now your battery is dead. I said, I didn't sabotage your car. So I called a neighbor, and she came over, and we uh, put the boosters on it and fixed it up and stuff like that. And she got on the phone, and she was calling her son, saying she was going to kick me out and this, that, and the other, and blah, blah, blah. And then I called her stupid and things like that. And he calmed her down and told her, he said, no, well, you know, you're really going to cut your own throat by doing that because, you know, he's the best person that you've ever had to stay at your house. Where was Elvira during the uh, yard sale? She was at home. Was she inside? Yeah. What was she doing? Sewing. Sewing? Yeah, we talked to some of the neighbors and they said that they didn't see her at the time. Well, yeah, she was there. I spoke to her on the porch, as a matter of fact. At one point, I had to ask her a question about, about um, a tray, a folding tray. Um, did any of the neighbors see her that you're aware of? I don't know. Okay. She didn't help out with the yard sale at all? She chose some items. She, what do you mean she chose them? She chose some items to go for sale. And where was the dog at this time? dog was there. What's the dog's name? Mary. She's very old. She has, she's just old. <laughs> she on medication mm -hmm. or anything? Who would give her the medication? Uh, now, that was Elvira. You were talking about the scar. Is that right before you left? I'm sorry. The, the scarf that you got on your hand, yeah. that fight that you, that you guys had? Yeah. Was that right before you left to us from yes. San Jose, Fernandez? Yes. Can we talk a little more about that? Sure. Um, so she, you said she swung and hit you with the, uh, the table, mm -hmm. correct, with the little where you eat? Yeah. And what happened after that? We had words right after she hit me with that on that particular from that the last time. And I told some I said something to her. I said, you know, that's like assault and battery of your I said, I don't want you to go to jail. And I said, because I, I don't know who's gonna run your house. She had sat down on the couch, the little what do you call it, bed thing across from me. She had sat down there and then she just started calling me every name in the book. So then I started to get up and I went to pick up a plate that needed to go to the kitchen. And I went to pick up the plate, and then she started in again and uh, started uh, hitting me with her fists, started taking swings at me, which she's not very good at doing. And uh, so 
I got enraged and I, I pushed her back towards the center of the room to get her out of the way. I, I don't know if I, I grabbed her like this and moved her and I held her get out of the way and I moved her and at one point she went down on the floor. We got into it and I hit her, uh, I hit her head or she hit her arm and it did not sound good. It sounded like it hurt her. I went to tell her, get up over just get up. You need to leave the room. And she, she was having trouble getting up in the center, but she was still cursing me and cursing me. And I lost it. And I, I started, and I pushed her back down onto the floor and I hit her head several times, I know, on the floor, which is a brick floor. Do you try to stop her from talking at any time to put her hand, hand over her mouth or? No, I didn't put her, your hands on her neck. I, no, I didn't do that. I was just so angry. And she seemed a little bit stunned, but she was still just absolutely livid, <laughs> screaming and yelling at me and everything else. I said, now, now I've done it. I said, I, I'm going to go to jail because you made me lose my temper. And I said something like, I really don't want to go to jail over something like this over. It's just ridiculous. And I was, I was mad, but measured. I wasn't screaming or yelling or anything like that. But she wouldn't give up on it. She wouldn't stop. How did you get her to stop? She followed me into the bedroom, and I went and I reached in, and um, I pulled out a gun. And when she went back to her bathroom, and I told her, you need to really relax and calm down. I said, this is enough. This is over. And I kind of lost my... I remember saying, this is enough. It's over. I don't remember. And I was talking at her, but I can't remember everything I said, to be honest with you. At one point, she reached down and got it. She had thrown a bunch of stuff like that was on a folding tray, not a folding tray, just a wire shelf. She uh, kicked it, threw it all over the place and went into the bedroom and everything. And um, she grabbed a, some sort of a mat. I do remember that. Shower mat or something. She bent down to pick it up or something and she went down on one knee. And when she went down on one knee, I pulled the trigger and shot her. Where did you shoot her? In the bathroom. Do you know where it hit her? No. I did see blood coming out from around her, her neck, back of her neck or something. And I pulled the door closed, and I never opened it again. Uh, how long were you there after that happened? Day and a half. What did you do with the gun? I put it on the bed. I didn't want to look at it. I was absolutely shocked. And you left it there? No. When I came to Santa Fe, I brought it with me. My intention was eventually to use it on myself. Where is it now? In some trees near the Masonic Cemetery. I think it's still there. I haven't looked at it in days. Was it hidden pretty well? Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you mind taking us out there to show us? Mm -hmm. I'll take you. So then you, uh, once this happens, you're there for about a day and a half or so. Then what, what are you thinking at this point? I was thinking that I was going to try and come to Santa Fe. Not Santa Fe. Um, Las Cruces. And I decided, well, I'll just take the gun. But I didn't want to do it there. So... Okay. With what little bit of money I did have, I had enough for like a tank of gas. And I came to Las Cruces, and I was going to, twice I came really close to pulling the trigger, but I didn't. What did you do with her car? It's in a pecan grove off of uh, Old Highway 28. Why did you leave it there? It r ran out of gas, and the battery was not good. So where did you go after that? Into town, and I've been hanging out ever since. Okay. Where have you been staying? Here and there, just where I could. There's no shelters or anything? In the shop. I don't know. Recently, I've come down with like, what I think is COPD, so I can't really walk that far without getting really tired and breathless and stuff. So. Okay. Can you give us just a minute? We'll be with back, right back with you? Of course. Thank you. This, uh, this form here is uh, advice of rights. I'd just like you to read it over, and then we'll fill in this stuff. You have a hard time seeing that? Or? Yeah, that, that have a question. Yeah, yeah, let me read it to you. So, no, I could, if you decide to answer questions now without the lawyer present, you know, I'm not quite sure what the, what the waiver means. The, the waiver means that uh, you've been advised of your white rights and that you're still willing yeah. to talk with us. Are you still willing to talk with us? Well, I suppose I should ask for a lawyer. <clears throat> I don't have one, of course, but. Well, yeah, okay. You're signing this of your own free will or not? Forcing you to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in court. So the uh, cemetery where you say the gun is hidden, is that here in Las Cruces or Santa Fe? 
It's here in Las Cruces. In Las Cruces, are you still willing to take us out there? Yes, I will. Thank you. I don't want to make it. What's that? I don't want to make it hard on anybody. Okay. So, um, I just lost it. What was your agreement, or was there an agreement for using the car? Yeah, I could use the car. Um, I had to do like most of the grocery shopping, and she preferred that I go. Well, but Nambi Drugs closed, and they, but they still had a store in Los Alamos, so she preferred to go to Nambi Drugs. Okay. So, yeah, I used to use the car. I did most of the driving because she got to where she she couldn't park, and she was, I don't know, she was having troubles. She used to agitate you quite a bit. It seemed like you seemed to get pretty frustrated when you're talking about the encounters that you guys have. Yes. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yes, it was, it was hard. And I did complain to one person one time. Who was that? Um, Lydia, a social worker. I used to know. What was the name? Her name was Susan. And who was the person you were on the phone with that one time? Was she? That was Susan. That was Susan? So that way she can kind of cooperate that maybe? Yes, yeah, she can. Did you guys discuss that in the time? I, I called her later, and I don't remember how much. It might have been a couple of days after all of this incident happened. And I did call her, and I I had to go down to the Arroyo. Well, for one reason, the cell reception there is terrible, and the only good place is in the Arroyo for some reason to pick it up. But it was also away from the house. And I, I must, I, poor Susan, I think I talked to her for like an hour and a half. I told her at one point, I said, you know, I think it's better off going back to being homeless or trying to find some other situation than to stay here. But then after that, she calmed down for quite a while. But I can honestly say, no lie whatsoever, that I never precipitated an argument. With all these hers, God is my witness that it's God's off. Because like I say, I really didn't want to confront things. Now, if I, made, if I made her mad, I guess I was the cause of it because she took something, you know, she got really mad when I wouldn't say I'm sorry. You know, there was time I'd say I don't know what I did. I lost my mind. I just lost my mind. And that and that gun too. That's I mean that was not. I was going through the storeroom and there had there were these huge, there were aluminum cases and then and you put things in them and like if you go in a river or something and they go in the river they're waterproof. You know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you call them, but I know that's kind of what they use them for. I said, what's in these? She goes, I have no idea. She said, so-and-so left and somebody that I don't know has left in here. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, I said, I'm going to move them. So I went to move them, and I, they were hard to open up, but I opened them up just to see if there was anything inside, and inside was this gun. I have no idea what kind of a gun it is. I found it there, and I thought, oh, no. Uh, and I didn't tell Elvira that, that it was there. She didn't know it was there. Or if she did, she would forgotten about it. I don't know who it belonged to, I don't know where it came from, but there it was in that one of that in that case. And so you moved it. So I moved it into the house because I didn't want there's no locks on the storerooms. There's two little storerooms there. There's no locks. So I put it inside in the house and I hid it under the cushion. Not very well, I just stuck it under there. And I kind of forgot about it for the longest time. At least seven months, eight months maybe. I didn't have it in the back of my mind that I was going to shoot her. That never occurred to me. She just pushed you to the point that I'm afraid so. I let her do it, so just as much to blame. What type of gun was it? it I don't know anything about guns. It's long. Well, I, I'll have to show you. You can't because you know, I have no idea what kind of gun. You didn't remove anything from the gun after you fired it? I pushed that little cap out, whatever that little brass part is that's left at one point. And where did that go, do you know? I have no idea. I don't know. I can't remember. It must, it must have been a, at least, I don't remember a lot after the first day. I think when I wrapped it up in a, in a bag, I, that's when I pushed that part out. I don't know where the part would be. I'm sorry. So, would you be willing to take us out there now? Yes, sir. I will take you there. Thank you. Robert Mondrian Powell was immediately arrested for the murder of Elvira Segura, and later that afternoon, Robert led officers to a Las Cruces cemetery where he had stashed the murder weapon in a tree. Montoya stated that he believed Robert stayed in Elvira's home for roughly a week during which time he held a yard sale, and once he was able to scrounge up some cash, he left for Las Cruces. 
Originally, Robert Powell was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. However, that changed to second-degree murder in December of 2016, when the case was transferred to the Santa Fe District Court. Although he was arrested, the case would take many twists and turns over the next 20 months. This was caused by attorneys arguing over motions, subpoenas, and witness interviews. Not to mention that also due to turnover in the DA's office, eight different prosecutors were assigned to the case, causing even more delays. In June of 2019, District Court Judge Glenn Ellington ruled the DA's office had violated Robert Powell's right to a speedy trial and dismissed all charges. Section D of the Order for Dismissal reports that during his 20 months pretrial incarceration, he lost 72 pounds. Prior to incarceration, he had post-traumatic stress and diverticulitis that have been worsened by his incarceration, specifically by stressors that include physical and sexual assaults by other inmates, as well as medical care that didn't resolve Robert's low blood pressure and heart issues while in custody. The judge wrote that, while the time of the case stretches only two months past the triggering mark for a speedy trial analysis, Mr. Powell's pre-trial incarceration has been oppressive and as such, he has been prejudiced. Robert, who previously confessed to killing Elvira Segura, was released and justice wasn't served for Elvira. Although he was set free, it seemed what came around went around. The case had been pending for a little over a year, when on November 7, 2018, his public defender was arguing over the conditions of his release. The thing Robert's lawyer didn't know was that he had died three weeks before the hearing due to hypothermia. The murder case of Elvira Segura was soon closed and never resolved. The murder of Elvira is among the top unusual homicide cases in New Mexico. Kevin Bacon once said, I believe all of us have darkness in our souls. Anger, rage, fear, sadness. I don't think that's only reserved for people who have horrible upbringings. I think it really exists and is a part of the human condition. I think in the course of your life you figure out ways to deal with that. For those who don't learn to cope with their own darkness, they say what comes around goes around. And for Robert Mondrian Powell, that may be true. But Elvira Segura sure deserved the kind of kindness that she put out into the world in return. In the end, she at least deserved justice. But instead, her kindness was in turn a fatal mistake that led to her unfortunate death. In looking for testimony from any remaining relatives, I found a GoFundMe page that seems to have been made for the children of Elvira. One of her family member writes that, On top of the shock and grief, we've been faced with a host of expenses. Her house needs to be cleaned and repaired, as the nature of the crime left several rooms contaminated. We are reluctant to ask for help, but we've stretched ourselves beyond our financial means to cover the many costs so far. On a sweeter note, the page also reads, Mom had recently retired and lived on her own, with Powell as a tenant for several years. She was happy to be done with work and constantly quilting and crafting for everyone in her life. She would tell us in every conversation about her hopes for us and her grandchildren. We will always remember our mom lighting up with joy and wearing her heart on her sleeve. She is achingly missed by everyone whose life she touched. I don't know what to say about guns. It's long.